So first, I, you like that meme there? <laughs> oh. Figured it would be a good place to start. All right. So, Cameron, since you're the only one here today, this agenda is for you. So why why do you have a budget? What is what does the average look like right now? So the typical med school budget. Um, you know, what are the different ways you can do it? And then we kind of start breaking into the practical day-to-day -day stuff. So let's jump over to it. So you can you can unmute your mic or uh I guess I can do these poll. No, I can't do the poll when I'm sharing my screen. So you can un unmute your mic. Why do you think you need a budget? Um, well, I guess the money that I'm currently using is, has a interest rate to it. So depending on how much I spend now, it could be amplified by a certain amount in five to 10 years from now. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and a certain amount is actually a pretty good amount. These are answers I've gotten in the past. So. You know, if, if if you don't have control over your money, who does? That means you're just kind of spending it willy-nilly. You're paying no attention. And this is the point you were getting to. For every dollar that you're spending right now, that's about a buck fifty you've got to pay back once you factor in all the interest and the fees and everything. You know, other students in the past have said, well, Casey, I need to budget so I don't run out of money. And normally I hear that from students who are budgeting right at the very top at our upper limits. Um, because anyone else who has a has a buffer in there, you can, if you run out, you're like, Casey, I did my best, but I still need a little bit more. They'd be okay. Um, you know, you want to be able to have some fun. And and you don't want that to take away from your money to eat. That that makes sense. And, of course, you eventually want to be debt free. Um, it's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's probably not even going to happen, you know, three, four years out of med school. But. After that, we're working towards getting you guys out of debt. So a budget now helps speed that up, help makes that make that a little bit better. Um, and, and I can speak for this. I've seen the effects of people living beyond their budgets, and it's just downright ugly. Um, you know, we're talking credit card debt. We're talking repossessions, things like that. There have been folks in my family that have had that issue, and a lot of students have had that, seen that in their families too. So if you can learn it now, you're going to be much better prepared for when you're in your practice. And and this isn't talking about budgeting for a practice. That's a whole nother different topic. But, you know, there's there's an old song, more money, more problems. And if you can learn to budget when you guys have no money and get in these really good habits that, that you are consistent with, when you actually have more money, you won't have more problems. Because you can make a lot bigger mistakes with your money when you have more of it at hand, because they will lend you ridiculous amounts of money to go do stuff that, quite frankly, is probably stupid in some cases. So, all right, let's jump into it. And we're going to go through all these slides, believe it or not, but we're going to do it pretty quickly. So here's typical. And you can see here that, that in general, the average med student's doing all right in most cases. Uh, so I, this all comes from a poll, and I didn't doctor any of the money. I didn't take I didn't take any of the extremes out. Uh, so I do feel like some of these items are a little bit higher than they probably would be if I had removed the extremes and stuck with the medians. But the average student spending about seven hundred dollars a month on their rent. That's good. That's kind of at the upper end of what I like to see, but it's still good. Um, the food, on the other hand, that's the red there. Uh, as long as you're not colorblind. You can you can see what the dog thinks of that. Um, that food budget is about eighty dollars, a little bit too high, um, but it is where people are falling right now. Now, granted, um, Cameron, I doubt it was you, but one of our students put six hundred dollars a month that they were spending on food, and, and you know, all things relative. I'm pretty sure that was me. <laughs> that was you. I'm pretty sure that it was like. I think I originally told you like. 500 but then we, i mean i've drastically come down i'm, I'm smarter with it now <laughs> all right i wasn't going to call you out on the recording but okay. apparently i accidentally did all um right. all right so we got to work on that still average student should be about 250 dollars a month on food um for the perspective 
my family of seven spends no more than about four hundred and fifty dollars a month on food. You know, I'll, I'll, I tonight's my grocery shopping night. I'm going to go, and I, my goal is to come in under a hundred dollars for the next week's worth of groceries. We'll see how we get, but if I come, try to come in under a hundred, I generally can keep the month the month under four fifty. And then there's all these other things. So everything else, that's that's your insurance, that's um, pet care, that's that's cell phones, everything else going on. All together, good budget. But again, the food budget's a little bit high. So so obviously, you know, you guys are all foodies. Um, either that or can't cook, so we need to get back in person so we can do how far can you stretch a chicken and get people in the kitchens. Um, or, you know, hey, sign up for our culinary medicine courses. Because added bonus, you get to learn how to cook. Um, which plug for our third and fourth year students. We do have a fourth year elective that takes place in March. All right. So be reasonable. The reasonable average budget for most med students is going to fall somewhere between the thousand and fifteen hundred dollars a month. And if you're doing that, you're doing really good, and you've got a bumper in there. You've got a little bit of of extra room in there so that if something happens. You know, car breaks down, hospital bills, I, dog gets sick. Uh, if something happens, you've got the ability to then go and um, borrow a little bit extra if you're within this monthly range here of about 1000 to 1500 You know, if you're already up at $1,900 a month, that's really the cap. And if something happens there, I have to tell you to ask family for help or... I have to see if we can go through a process where we increase your cost of attendance, but those are rare that I can get those through. Uh, there's only a few instances where we can, and they have to be necessary, unavoidable, and emergent uh, for that to happen. So it's just rare that that's that we're able to do that. But still, your goal should be between a thousand and fifteen hundred. All right. So. Question for you is, should I budget based on my overage check or my refund check, whatever you want to call it? Or should I make that refund check match my budget? What do you think? Number one, yep, you should definitely budget based on your actual refund check. Or I'm sorry, I said that wrong. You should make your refund check match your budget. So your first step before you do anything is not, hey, how much money is the school going to give me? It's how much money do I need? So let's go and take a look at this. And this is a spreadsheet that you and everyone else should be familiar with. And let's get this to come up here. There we go. That pop up on the screen for you. Nod your head if it did. Good. So I took this and I created this based entirely on that average student budget. So we've got our $706 in rent, our $332 a month in food. And... From there, I just kind of split everything else out based on what I hear from students and had to find an extra place to put those $2. So that's why your cell phone's $47, not $45. Um, you know, and everyone's a little bit different. Some of these numbers will be moved around. So maybe you don't have a cell phone, but you take care of a pet or, you know, who knows what's going on. Um, but this would be an average one. And the place I always start is with this with this worksheet. So when I'm working with you guys, I'm always going to default to this worksheet, and I find that it's actually one of the best ones. And don't forget, it's on the website, Financial Aid Tools Budget Worksheet. Uh, and, and each year, once we update it, it'll have that current year's number in front of the budget worksheet page. Um, and so before you come up with your yearly budget, you really need to have your monthly budget, which sounds a little bit odd. Normally, I'd like to start from the highest level and work my way down. But in this case, for you guys, you need to start at, okay, what do I need per month? What am I gonna spend per month? Start out with our basic necessities. So basic necessities are rent, utilities, food. Okay, also basic necessity, I need transportation. I need to get to and from school. All right, after basic necessities, we start filling in the high level wants. And some of these may not feel like wants, they're gonna feel a little bit like needs, like, you know, the first few months of COVID, we all needed a haircut, or at least we thought we did. But is it a life or death thing? No, it's not. So we factor this in here, and we do factor in these high-level needs. So a high-level need is something that you really feel like you can't live without, even though you probably wouldn't die. Uh, so a haircut, a cell phone, you know, 
maybe going out to eat every now and then, you know, whatever that is. And then you start factoring in more of your lower level needs. Now, as a med student, we're not going to be able to, or I'm sorry, lower level, lower level want. As a med student, we're not going to be able to get all the way down the list of your wants because, you know, hey, I want a new iPhone. Well, you know, you're paying for it with loans. Probably not the best time to buy a brand new iPhone. Maybe mom or dad can uh, let you get the free upgrade or something if you happen to be on their plan. Um, but, you know, maybe it's time to upgrade your old one to a slightly newer one. You know, the example I always use is I'm rocking an iPhone 7 here. It is, what, three, four years old, but it's brand new brand new phone, three, four-year-old technology. Um, but it works just fine. It works 100 times better than my old iPhone SE. So I wanted an upgrade, so I got one, just not the brand new one. It's kind of kind of compromise you make when you have a budget. Um, and so you go in here, you plug these monthly numbers in, and like I said, the monthly numbers then inform our yearly numbers. Now, when you get out in real life, this is actually going to change. So you're going to look at, okay, what's my yearly income after taxes? And I'm going to break that down into what I need to spend it on and when I need to make those expenses. So we almost flip-flop this entirely when you're out making a real budget. I shouldn't say real budget. When you're out making a real income instead of living off loans. So you click over here on the M2 planner because a lot of our students are going to be um, going to be M1s that are watching this. Uh, except, Cameron, you're here today. You're our representative for your entire class and, in fact, the entire school. Uh, so you come over here, and you've got that same budget carrying over. We've got our tuition plugged in, and then we've got things like step and all that sort of stuff that's not fun, uh, but you have to pay for anyway. Uh, I, I see you kind of cringing when I say step. Uh, so we've got our savings account. You know, this right here, this thousand dollars from saving. What I was thinking is, a, is a med student goes home from school after first year, or they stick around here in Greenville because hey, it's a pretty cool area. Uh, but you get a part-time job over the summer. You do some research, you enter some data, um, you go back to an old job that you had in undergrad or, or in high school or something like that. And you're like, okay, part of that goes towards living over the summer. The other part goes towards actually taking a vacation. Uh, and then the rest goes towards, okay, can I pay a little bit towards school? And in my case, I think this student probably could. They were able to save up $1,000. And that's going to come in and affect how much they actually borrow. Now, I want to highlight down here at the bottom this combined data amount. So that's their unsubsidized loan. That's their uh, grad plus loan, both added together, hence combined aid. Um, where we came in low with that budget is what's allowing us so that if an emergency comes up, we've got about a $6,300 buffer here that we can take advantage of if a real emergency comes up. And I don't know about you, but even, even as a homeowner, I can't think of many emergencies that are going to cost me more than $6,300 in a, in a real pinch. So that kind of a budget, that average budget of $1,345, that works out really well for a second-year student. You know, a third-year student has an actually even bigger um, budget buffer there, simply because third year is a little bit longer, so your aid's a little bit bigger, or your maximums are a little bit bigger. All right, any questions for me so far? That That's the, the budget and how we work it out. All right, back over here to this. So let's talk the different budgeting styles. And, and I will say up front, they are all gonna sound really, really similar. And that's because they are. And the second reason for that is there's only so many different ways to talk about the same exact thing. And that's all budgets really come down to the same exact thing. So the first one is you actually organize it in categories. So you could organize it in needs and wants. You could order it, could organize it in housing and food. So housing, of course, is your rent, but it could also be um, your phone, your uh, utilities, all of that, uh, your renter's insurance. And then food can be eating in, eating out, all that stuff together, toiletries, everything, you can toss it in there. Um, you be you decide how detailed you want to be on that category system. And basically you just say, okay, I've got 300 in this category, 400 in that category, and my goal is to underspend the category. So spend at or under what that category is. Now, zero-based is kind of similar, but it's a little bit more detailed. 
Uh, Zero-based budgeting says, okay, I have X amount coming in, and my amount going out needs to equal that exactly. So in real life after school, that's going to include savings and retirement and things like that. Or while you're in school, you're saying, okay, my rent is this, my utilities average out to be this, so that you know each by the end of the year, it all equals out and I'm not overborrowed, but I borrowed exactly what these utilities should be. The idea of zero base is that your incoming always equals your outgoing, even if that outgoing part of it's going to savings or something, which again is not something we do while we're in med school, unless you have a working spouse or something like that. Um, so zero based in always equals out, and you're very detailed in that. So groceries equals $235 a month or whatever your number comes out to. Um, necessities that I buy at the grocery store equal another 15 to $20 per month, whatever number you come up with. And then eating out is going to be broken down as well. So you could break eating out into going out with friends and meal replacement eating out, which is kind of how I always look at it. The next is my, is the envelope system. So if you listen to Dave Ramsey, if you know even know who that is, this is his baby right here. That is is what he uses. <clears throat> Where I tend to use this budgeting system, and and it's very much like a zero based system and a category system as well. Uh, when I tend to use this this system is when I have students who consistently overspend a budget, or at least overspend a piece of their budget. Usually it's the eating out budget, let's just be honest. Uh, and so when that happens, you set a budget and you try and live by it, you try and live by it, try and live by it, and it just never works. Then I'm gonna tell you to take that cash out. So if you budget $50 a month for eating out, I'm gonna tell you to take $50 cash out in a month, put it in your wallet, put it in an envelope, and that is your eating out money. Because guess what you can't do? You can't overspend cash. When the envelope runs dry, you know the budget's gone. Now, does that mean you're never going to overspend that budget item anymore? No, but it means that you're being intentional about it as opposed to accidentally overspending it. You're making that cognizant decision to go, I know my money is gone from this budget item, but I'm still going to go to Moe's for Monday because you know it's, it's what I do or, or whatnot. Um, but that's an envelope system. It's really kind of on the more extreme side of a budgeting system, but it works really well when you uh, when you have those issues where you can't reel in the spending. You know, another student I had who who their problem was online spending, so that's a little bit harder to do in an envelope. But we made them put the money in a different account, and so it acted as a virtual envelope, and they could only spend until that money. They got the, the notice that they were getting close to zero in that in that account. Uh, so that worked. The last one is priority spending. So a priority budget is one that you're going to use. Honestly, it's my least favorite budget, but it makes sense for people on really tight budgets. So priority budget spending is going to be, I'm setting my top priorities and I pay those first. So top priorities, of course, are our needs that we need to keep us in line. So priority number one, roof over my head. Priority number two, utilities for that place. Priority number three, eating. Priority number four, transportation. And you're like, well, Casey, these are all eat, all about equal. Yes and no. They're all needs, but first you need to place over your head. Second, you need you know, some heat and warmth there. And third, you need to eat. Because you need a place to keep that food once you buy it. Um, and then after that, we kind of move down the list. Now, where it becomes a priority system that's different from these other ones is this works well, one in extreme cases when you're on, on very low budget, but also when your budget or, or your income is really variable. So, you know, for some people, you know, if you're on say a commission-based system or say you work, end up working at a hospital where your pay is based on how many patients you see or, or practice, I should say. You know, I have a doctor friend who always said, he's like, I can't ever take days off because I've got to work half the day before I even break even on the day. You know, he had to see patients until about noon, take his lunch break. And if he wanted to take any time off, it always had to be the afternoon because that was his time to actually make money as a doctor. You know, first part of the day, paid the light bills and paid his, his office staff. 
uh, second part of the day is when he paid himself. So when he took actual days off, he had to pay the practice uh, out of his pocket. And that just, that was difficult for him. But if he happened to be there all the time and, and patients were coming through really quickly, he would end up with some extra money at the end of the month. <clears throat> and that's where these priority system can, can be beneficial too. So you set down lower in your priority is like extra savings or extra money down on my house or extra money on my student loans. <clears throat> and so as long as I've taken care of all my necessities and all my high level needs or high level wants, then I start moving down the priority list with whatever money is left. And this is always, <clears throat> excuse me, this is always those extra things, those things that are good to do, but you don't always have money for. Uh, even vacation spending would fall under this when it comes to a priority piece. So which one do I think is the best? Actually, let me ask, Cameron, do you have an opinion on which one you think is the best for you? And there's no wrong answer. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the one that kind of sticks out as not the best one for me would be the zero base. Um, I mean, as far as envelopes are concerned, I, I mean, I check my account to make sure that I'm, you know, staying at the right level. I think maybe categories would, would be would be best. Yep. So, for, so in your case, uh, a categorical system that is a little bit more broad would work for you. Um, a lot of people don't like to dive down into the nitty gritty on every single piece of their budget. And as long as you're doing okay on that budget, that's, that's perfectly fine. Generally speaking, I actually prefer your least favorite, which is the zero based budgeting system. Uh, so because you guys are, it works well for people on fixed incomes and med students, you guys are on a fixed income. You get two disbursements a year. So you know what that's going to be. Um, and so. Uh, you need to go in and be very meticulous about that. Now, if you're meticulous in your categories and you're not overspending them, that's great. And that'll work well for you. You just got to make sure that you've got categories covering all your actual expenses, even the ones that you only have like twice a year, like auto insurance and things like that. Um, so that works. And we've talked a little bit about how med school is different from a normal budget. Normal budget, you've got money coming in every month. Med school budget, it's only that twice a year you've got money coming in. You know, a little bit extra if you have to dig into that buffer a little bit, but but generally speaking, it's twice a year money. So the way I always tell you guys to do it, and I highly recommend this, is that any major expenses you know you're going to have, take those, take that money out right when you get your, your disbursement for the year or for the semester. Then take what's left of that. So that's things like step, that's uh, setting up your apartment if you're an M1, that's... Um, you know, sketchy micro and, and whatever else you're getting for, for that. Set that money aside, even if you're not buying it or paying it right then, set that out. And then I'm gonna take whatever's left from that disbursement and I'm dividing it by six. And six because you get two a year, so six months is half the year. And that's your set money for the year or for the, for the month is once you divide it by six. Now in a zero based, it kind of looks like this. This is an old example from a budget a few years ago. But you get the gist, you know, rent is six fifty, and that's already in there and, you know, down the line. But you're plugging everything in and you can see up here, this is actually the every dollar app. Uh, it gives you the check mark here. It says this is an every dollar budget because your planned is equal to what your, your plan spending is equal to your planned income, which doesn't actually show on here. And this is about halfway through the month, just to give you an idea of what that looks like or a different view, I always prefer to see on this one, what money do I have remaining? Not how much I've spent, because that can be a little bit depressing, but what do I have left to spend? So, you know, this person knows, hey, I've got $41 left to spend on groceries. I might need to tighten up a little bit. Or it's the last day of the month and you're like, okay, well, this is a little bit extra that I can use for today, or I can use it next month and, and eat a little bit better next month. And that's just how you'll you'll use that. And each month resets, but you'll have a little bit extra cash in that envelope or wherever you need it. All right. You get to be the spokesperson of everyone, Cameron. Sorry. But I've already helped you out with this one. What is a need and what is a want? Like actual definition of need and actual definition of wants. I guess for need, uh... Rent, you need 
to pay your bills, pay your tuition, um, have basic things like that. And wants, I would say, like going out to eat or going on vacation. Gotcha. So, so then a need is what you, what you absolutely need to stay alive. It is what it sounds like. And a want are those extra things that make life a little bit more livable, right? Mm-hmm. All right, here's some examples. If, if this will work. Ah. All right. Are you a coffee drinker? Seeing the yes. So which one of these is a need? Say the left. <laughs> the left. Coffee is a need for a medical student, most, and of course, hot tea if that's your, your jam as well. But Starbucks does isn't a need. That's a want. Quite frankly, I've had better coffee myself. But, um, but you know, it's what's over in the hospital, so it's convenient. Uh, but, yeah, so you need some coffee. And in the example here, you know, a cup of drip coffee that you brew yourself, probably about four to five cents, even for the decent stuff. A um, cup of Starbucks, you're not getting out under a dollar. So got to, got to bear that in mind when you're making these decisions. All right. So what is what is this signifying here? Two very different types of cars. Yeah. So this is your transportation. You need transportation, but it might be what looks like my first car, and it might be one of the brand new Jeep Rubicons, which, or I'm sorry, that's the I forget what they call these. Uh, Renegade, the Jeep Renegade, so the Jeep truck, which is like not a dream car of mine, but high up on the list. So you need transportation, but it doesn't necessarily have to be brand new. And here we have food. I need to eat. You all need to eat. But it doesn't necessarily need to be a steak for our meat eaters. It doesn't necessarily need to be a high end um vegetarian restaurant when we're eating plant-based what it can be is you know for everyone plant-based or not it can be a plant-based meal because those are going to be a whole lot cheaper plant-based protein is just cheaper on average than than animal-based protein um and it doesn't have to be super fancy doesn't have to be out you could actually make any of these things at home generally better than you can have it elsewhere so it needs to be it needs to be food, and I'll be honest, it needs to even taste good, but it doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be expensive. All right, this is a tough one. This is, you know, for our married students, this is an argument. For our unmarried students, be prepared. What we're looking at here is your thermostat. You can save a good amount of money on your uh, heating and cooling bill by moving that thermostat up from 72 to 75. And depending on the apartment, if you don't have roommates and you're living alone, that savings could be 40 to $50 a month during the hot months of the summer. Now, if you have roommates, if you've got the ability to split this, maybe it's not so bad to keep it at 72 because that difference is split four ways. That's an extra $10 a month for four people. And that's okay. But you could also still just save that money and bump it up. Or flip it, go go to the winter, have the house a little bit cooler, and dress in some more layers. Any of these things can save you a lot of money. Now, you don't have to be what one student I had in the past did who didn't turn their heater on until it got down to 55 in their house. That's a bit too cold, in my opinion. That's a bit extreme. Um they had cats, and they actually started turning it up more because they were worried about their cats. And I was like, the cats actually have a fur coat built in. Um, you, on the other hand, do not. So, you know, all things in moderation, but adjusting your thermostat a little bit can help with that and save you really a, a significant amount of money. All right. Is this a hard one for you, Cameron? You can nod. Eating in and eating out. Again, you need to eat but it doesn't need to be eating, eating out. And this is the one that hurts me. It doesn't even need to be Mo Monday. You can save money by not even going to Mo's Monday and eat something else at home. So that's a tough one, but it's one, one you need, need to remember. And even if you're not a good cook, 
As long as you got a few specialties, you're going to be all right there. All right. Here's the tips and tricks. Now, the how-to is one you have to... I'm not going to say you have to figure it out on your own because you're more than welcome to come and sit with me and we'll work on what works for you. Um, but you have to try those different model, those different models out, the categories, the zero-based, all of that, and see what actually works for you because what works for me will not necessarily work for you. Um, even when I got married, what worked for my wife didn't work for me. So once we figured out who was doing the budget, it became my way. Um, and, and, you know, with input, of course. Now, the first trick, the first tip, actually not trick, but the first thing you need to remember about budgets, your first one's going to be utter trash. It's going to be the most idealized Spartan budget you have ever seen in your life. And you're like, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to save so much money. And then you're going to get to the end of the month and you're like, oh my gosh, I overspent my budget so much. I can't budget. I'm never doing it again. But you need to go in understanding that first one's going to be utter trash. Your next budget's going to be a little bit better. And then you're going to get a little bit better after that and after that. And the first thing you start doing when you have a budget that's not working out is you try and correct spending. That always needs to be the first option is, okay, I've got this budget. Let me try and fix my spending to match the budget. And so you will get a little closer the next month, even with your first trash budget. Now, after that you are going to then once you can no longer adjust your spending you are going to start adjusting your budget a little bit you're going to make corrections to your budget so it's no longer so spartan so idealized so it's really it's no longer such a bad budget you know keep working on it and you're still going to have months that aren't great but you know you'll get better and better and you'll just learn to learn to roll with it when you do have those weird months. Like heaven knows, this month has been a weird month for my family. You know, unexpectedly had to buy a car, unexpectedly had to do a bunch of things. So it shot the monthly budget. That's where once you're out and working, savings comes into play. Um, and then we start talking about cash rules. So cash rules simply because, like I talked about with the envelope system, you can't overspend it. So if you've got trouble spending, if you have consistently overspend an area, that's where you apply the envelope system. Don't do it to your whole budget. Do it just to that one item. You know, the Ramsey approach would be to take everything and put it in envelopes each month. That's a headache. That's extreme. That's dealing with a lot of cash in a largely cashless society since most of us use our cards. But if you're consistently overspending something, take out the cash. And here's where we start getting into some of the tricks. You always need to ask yourself is, can it be bought used? The next question after that that's not written on here is, should it be bought used? So we're not talking mattresses and things like that. Those should not be bought used, even though they can be. Um, but can it be bought used? I want to get this study book for step one, step two, whatever the case may be. You know, I can buy last year's model. There's not anything really drastically changed. They probably did a little bit of editing for the new one. Maybe they changed a couple of the questions around. So can it be bought used? Furniture is a good one for this. Again, not your mattress, but piece of wooden furniture, clean it up when you get home, it looks great. And this is actually where you students actually do a really good job because I watched the uh, yard sale page for what's going on and what's available. Um, Y'all put things out there to sell and I see other students buying it. So buying used is great. Um, and just again, see where you can. Everyone's got their limit on that. Some things you don't want to buy, buy used. The next thing is write it down. You know, I know that, you know, we always get on our phones, things like that. We want an app for everything. But there's enough studies that show that when we write things down, we have better recall of them. Uh, so if you're going to do it on, on an app, on a phone, maybe use your Apple Pencil. Maybe use your Surface Pencil or whatever it is that you've got. Otherwise, take some time to write things down on actual paper. Um, what this comes down to is, especially when you're working with a budget and you're like, I'm going to stick to this budget this year, and the beginning of the year is a great time to really take the time to write it down, uh, is you are going to write it down, and then I'd recommend you sign it. You know, there's some studies that I've looked up that show that when you do something like this, you're going to treat it like a contract. Like you've given your word, even if you've only given your word to yourself on this when it comes to your budget, 
So taking that time to write it down will keep you closer to that budget, even on a subconscious level, without having to work all that extra hard for it. Uh, does it work for everyone? No, but it does work for a majority of people. Uh, the next thing, and this is this is a good trick that I have used time and time again. Uh, it's actually one that my wife and I um, use. So anytime anyone's going to spend something over a hundred dollars, other than like our our food our weekly food budget or anything like that, we have to stop and we have to check with the spouse. Now, not everyone's married, so in you guys' cases who aren't married, or even if you are, it's still a good idea. You need to stop and marinate for a day if you're going to be spending over a hundred dollars. You know, that threshold may be a little bit different for you. Maybe it's over $50 you need to marinate on something. But this is going to have you stop and think about it and go, okay, do I really need this or am I just wanting this as an impulse buy? Impulse buys tend to go away pretty quickly uh, unless I'm at the grocery store and then those impulse buys go into my mouth uh, when I get home. But generally speaking, those aren't $100 purchases. So can I marinate on this for a day? Is that going to be okay? And... Is it a case of maybe I'm being pressured into buying something? So, you know, cars are a really good example of this. You're on the lot and they're like, I can give you this price today and I can't do it tomorrow. Well, one, that's a sales pitch thing. They'll give you the same price tomorrow if you walk in. They won't even remember they told you that yesterday. But it's a tactic that gets you to try and buy things that you don't necessarily need and get you to make decisions faster than you should. By So by setting this one day waiting period, you're going to be doing better. Now, what about these, these hugely fluctuating bills? So, you know, for most people, what I'd recommend is that if your um, company will allow it, you can get, uh, I forget what exactly what they call it, but it's basically an equalized bill. They'll look at your bills over the last year for that unit that you're in or that house that you're in, and they'll equal it out to an, the same amount every month. And then they'll kind of get closer to the end and they're like, hey, you're going to fall a little bit short or, hey, you actually overpaid us. So these next few months, we're going to drop them amount. And if you're a little short, they'll be like, hey, we need to go up a little bit over the next year. Uh, but that tends to be a lot easier to budget because, you know, I can tell you right now, I just paid my my gas bill for the house and it was $19 for the last month. It's not going to be $19 in December when the heat is running. That's just kind of how it works. The $19 runs the runs the water heater, the, you know, it gets up to $200, $300 in the, in the winter because, you know, seven people have got to have a, a house big enough for everyone. So try and get them to equalize it. Now, if they don't, and you've got this $50 bill in October and you've just gotten your disbursement a month and a half early, that means you need to save the difference in your monthly budget so that when these higher bills come in December, you've got it sitting there. You don't go, oh, I've got extra money this month because the power bill was so cheap. I'm going to go spend that on food. I'm going to go spend that on uh, an extra piece of study material. You know, all things that are good, but not good if they're not in the budget. All right. And then my rules to live by. So if we're talking food, you are going to buy it only if it's on sale, if it's in season. And if it's not, you don't buy it at all. The exclusions to this are kind of your staples that never go on sale and don't have a season, like milk and bread and and flour and sugar and things like that. Uh, but when I'm talking fruits and vegetables especially, if it's on sale, I'll buy it. If it's in season, I'll buy it. Because if it's in season, it's cheaper. That means they've got a whole bunch of it. Uh, and then not at all if it's the regular price. You know, right now, we're getting a little bit cooler. Your berry prices are starting to go way up. Like strawberries are have hit like $4 a pint now. I'm not buying strawberries this time of year. Now, a few weeks ago, we got the last of the season of the strawberry season strawberries. They were a dollar a pint. I was buying those like crazy. Um, so, again, if it's in season, it's going to be cheaper. You may get these occasional off season sales because they've got a surprising amount of it in or something like that. Uh, so, just keep an eye on that. that and here's the other, other thing when it comes to food if it's, off, if it's not in season, go buy it frozen. Because frozen food was picked in season when they had so much of it they didn't know what to do with. So they froze it and they keep it in these huge freezing warehouses to then distribute later. Uh, so it's actually as good as what you had before. Um, in most cases, there, there are some exceptions. I'll, I will completely agree with that. Uh, but it's as good and it's, it was picked at the height of freshness. 
and then quickly frozen and is ready for you. Works great when you are uh, making stews and, and one pot meals and things like that. Now, other than that, so if we're talking clothes or, or things like that, so anything else, I'm buying it if it's on sale. I'm buying it if the season just ended. So clothes, if you buy your clothes a couple seasons ahead, so you know, right now I would be buying my summer clothes for next year. Why? Because they're a whole heck of a lot cheaper. And with five kids in the house, that's what we've got to do is buy them, buy them a year out and just keep them. Um, so that season just finished, so that means the prices are coming down. Or if you're in you know, a rush on something or, say, a wedding or something that snuck up on you and you need something to wear for it, well, find where it's on sale. Because if it's not on sale at Kohl's, it's on sale somewhere else. It, you know, pennies or, or whoever hasn't gone out of business during this whole COVID thing. And then I'm not going to buy anything more than the absolute necessities. Hey, Andrew, thanks for joining us. Hey, Casey, how are you? Good. Um, right now, it's just me, you, and Cameron. So, so we're kind of you're kind of jumping in towards the end, but that's okay. All right. So, if it's something else that's not food, and I need it, I'm going to buy only the necessity of what I need. I'm not going to go. Oh wow, this is buy one get one fifty percent off. I'm going to go ahead and get two, if I don't need two, because then I've already spent an extra chunk of money that I didn't need to spend. You know, it's something that's hard for a lot of us to fathom is that just because it's on sale doesn't mean I actually save money if I didn't need it in the first place. You know, you come home with something that's like, oh, I bought this on sale. Well, did we need that? No. Uh, and then this is something that most of our med students do really well. This is the best tip for budgeting that's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Have a roommate. If you absolutely at all can, have a roommate. Because if you have roommates, your rent is so much cheaper. And that's the biggest thing you really have control over from a year-to-year -year basis uh, that can drastically impact your borrowing and your budgeting. You know, After that would be your food, and we've already talked pretty extensively about that. You know, a little bit more on the minor side is can you carpool to work or, quite frankly, as close as some of y'all live, can you walk to work? Can you ride a bike to work? Um, that's entirely up to you. We actually have a coworker in the office who lives close enough. She uh, she walks to work as, as long as the weather's nice. As long as you can, go right ahead. And then the last, last trick is to look at some of these savings websites. So particularly uh, when you get to holidays, when you get around wedding times for, for things you'll have to buy a gift for. Go out to hiptosave.com. Go out to southernsavers.com. See what you can find on the cheaper side. Because um, there's always deals going on. And these guys also, uh, or these ladies, I should say, both of these are, are ladies who run these websites, do a spectacular job of putting all the sales together and letting you know when the best time to buy things is. Uh, once a year, they actually will even say, okay, here's the list for the year. And in January, this stuff usually goes on sale. In February, this stuff goes on sale, and so on and so forth. And, you know, normally it's, you know, like Black Friday sales are, are always good ones. But believe it or not, generally you'll find even better deals, and they don't advertise these quite as much. You'll find better deals right before the holidays. So a week or two before the holidays, you're going to find the best deals. Now, Black Friday still might be good for things that you need to go get, but you know, watch those for a little bit later. Every single thing you're ever going to buy has a season that it's on sale. And I do want to highlight Southern Savers. I'm not going to take you out to that. We we talk about that more when we do our grocery savings website. But if you go out to Southern Savers and click on your grocery store of choice, they do a good job of helping you make a list and telling you what's on sale and what um what easy-to-use coupons and things are out there. You know, I'm a big fan these days of electronic coupons. That's why I go to Lidl. I'm going to go tonight, and I know for a fact I've got 20% off, or no, I think it's 30% off of one of the products that they also have on sale this week. So I don't have to cut anything. I don't have to go through a newspaper. I literally just take my phone and scan it. When are you going to go somewhere without your phone? You all have your phones all the time, just like me. Uh, so Southern Savers is a good one and shows you how to do things pretty easy. Uh, but, hey, this is a plug for my grocery savings one. It's a good time to do it or it's a good time to learn more about it. Now, you guys get to learn from me and my mistakes. I, a few years ago, was wanting to go thrift shopping on a Saturday. 
I was like, hey, said this to my wife. Hey, Stacy, we've got this this 50% off sale. It looks great. It's like, we don't need anything. And you can see your response down there. It's good practice and self-control and not going. And that was one of those, like, uh, like a little bit chagrined. It's like, gosh, I'm the one teaching finances and, and whatnot. But, you know, that's that's one thing where a good spouse will help you out um, is, is keep you in check. But it's also a good reminder. Just because something on, on sale or just because there's a good sale on something doesn't mean you need to go out to do that. Um, I say this. We actually ended up going out that day and spent $2 on about a $100 rice cooker because every once in a while we want to have people over and our small rice cooker can only feed our family. We want to have people over. We need to get a 10, 10 cup rice cooker. Um, next to an Instapot, which I don't have yet, but want probably one of the best purchases ever uh, for a house is a good rice cooker because you can do so much in it. Other than that would be a crock pot, highly recommended. All right, and this is coming back to your food. This is my favorite Julia Child's quote. You just gotta have that what the heck attitude in the kitchen. Try and cook. You're gonna save so much more money at home by cooking. And what is the worst that can happen is you could have a bad meal or two. And then you go, okay, I know not what I know what not to do next time. We all learn much better from our mistakes than our successes. So if you go in with that attitude, you're like, you know what the heck? I'm gonna try this out. I'm gonna see if I can make it. Recipe I saw online or a recipe you or something you had at a restaurant once, you're like, I'm gonna see if I can recreate it. Well, go in what the heck and try it out. It's gonna be cheaper. You're gonna learn something, whether it's good or bad. And if it's bad, you're gonna definitely learn it really well. So favorite Julia Child's quote there. All right, does anyone, either of you guys know what Tenstoffel means? And you and you could see it also Tanstoffel before. Um, that's the Southern version. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, that's actually a, an economic principle if there's no such thing as a free lunch. What I would say is that's not true when it comes to med school. Now, truth be told, it does still hold true in some ways, but once we're back in person, once we can have our lunch and learns again, take advantage of all the free lunch. It's a good trade-off. An hour of your time, you're going to learn something. You're going to get 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 some benefits there, and then you got a free lunch out of it. So there is such a thing as a free lunch. It just costs you a little bit of time. All right. Words to live by: fail to plan, plan to fail. If you don't have a budget you're gonna overspend. It's really that simple. If you don't have a budget, you're gonna end up borrowing way more than you thought you'd, you would. But if you do have a budget, and you're not just kind of doing it willy-nilly, you have something to keep yourself in check with. And every once in a while, you will overspend that budget. That's normal, that happens to everyone. Um, Andrew, before you jumped on, I was saying, you know, we unexpectedly had to buy a car this month. That shot the budget for the month, so, you know, you plan ahead for that sort of thing, but you can only do so much. And then you go back to the, to the budget next month. One bad budget month doesn't mean that you've killed everything. Uh, and then this is the other one that, that I don't want you to fall on the other extreme of going too Spartan. The number one rule in budgets is not to cut out all the fun out of your life. Inevitably, inevitably Spartan budgets have, that have no allowance for entertainment are doomed to fail. If you don't plan to have a little bit of fun, you are going to hate the budgeting process. So factor in a little bit of that fun. Factor in going out to dinner with friends once you're able to do that again. And while you aren't able to do that, factor in going out to the mountains to hike, um, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, you know, Don't go crazy on this. We're not talking a trip out to Alaska or something like that. But do factor in a little bit of fun. Or since you can't go out to eat with friends, you know, maybe you factor a little bit more into your food budget this month and you try out a few new recipes. You try out, you know, can I learn how to cook a steak the out and brown way and, and things like that. Uh, just don't cut all the fun out or, you know, you'll be measurable. The other big thing is tracking and how you track entirely is up to you. Uh, Mint is a really good tracking app. It's great at tracking. It's great as, as a historical, what have you been spending? I don't like it as an actual budgeting app, but it's really good for, for the tracking portion. EveryDollar.com or, or the EveryDollar app we've already talked about. Um, you know, you could also do pen and paper. Or in my case, I'm at Wells Fargo, and they've got a pretty decent budgeting app inside their website. 
I like it. It tells me kind of what I've been spending, how I've been spending it. Uh, it gets things wrong occasionally because it's going to treat Walmart as all food or things like that when in, instead you just went to Walmart to give them an oil change. Uh, but you just need to keep an eye out for those few things. Uh, everywhere else you can kind of move those things around. Wells Fargo doesn't allow that on theirs so because it's all pre-programmed. But you do need to track your budget each month. You need to see where you've been doing that spending. Um, and Cameron, as you were saying earlier, keeping an eye on that from you know daily or, or at least a couple times a week is where you really need to be. Not checking it once at the end of the month or checking it once at the beginning of the month to see, oh, how did I do? Well, that's not really checking in on your budget. That's not tracking it at all. That's seeing whether you failed or, or succeeded by complete accident last month. All right. Budgeting pitfalls. We're going to take these one by one. First one. I'm not picking on Starbucks. It's just they're the most iconic. Going out and, and spending extra money on something that's really, really cheap. You know, it would be like going to Moe's and paying for rice or just their black beans when that's really, really cheap to provide for yourself at, at home. And they're going to charge you about four or five times, if not 10 times uh, what the actual cost is. Coffee's the same way. You know, and again, I pick on coffee. Um, coffee at home is about five cents to make, even if you're adding kind of a flavored creamer or something into it. And that's per cup. I've got mine sitting right here. I made it with, with my lunch, and, and so I'm drinking that. Coffee at Starbucks, you're never going to get out cheaper than a dollar. That's if you're lucky. That's if the folks over at the Starbucks in the hospital actually like you. Uh, so do treat them nice. It gets you cheaper coffee. Um, but if you want something a little bit fancier or a shot of something in it for flavor, you're not getting out cheap. What's my next pitfall? Can you guys figure out what this is? Is that like TV streaming stuff? It is. It's entertainment, uh, just kind of in general. But in this case, it is particularly TV in the picture. Um, I hate to say it. We don't need cable. We don't need every single streaming source known to man. And here's the other thing. If you guys want to have them, every single person living in a house doesn't need it. Netflix in some states has started cracking down, but they haven't done that so much in South Carolina yet. I would say you can split the cost of this four ways or, hey, I'll get Netflix, you guys get Hulu, you gals get Amazon Prime, whatever the case may be. Um, find ways to make it cheaper, find ways to split it. Hey, if your parents have Amazon Prime, you don't need a Prime account. And here's what you should do. You guys as students can get the Prime for free, or I'm sorry, not free. You can get the Prime for half price. So $50 a year gets you access to all the Prime stuff. That's way cheaper than Netflix or anything like that. Um, and you can save your parents a little bit of money, and they'll be happy. They'll give you the extra money maybe or some of it in between. Or maybe just take you out to an extra meal if you're lucky. All right. My next one here, and this is one that was from the times before COVID. And you can probably see me right here in the middle. Mission trips are, generally speaking, a really good thing to do. But it is a pitfall of a budget for a medical student if you only have loan money to pay for it. Um, simply put, I don't like the idea of folks taking out loan money to go on trips, even if they're for good causes. On the other hand, what you can do, and as med students, you guys should be able to find a way to do this, is you can fundraise. You can, you can try and get someone else to help pay for a mission trip if you want to go on one. So try that out. If it's a religious-based one, go to your church uh, or, or wherever you go. Uh, if it's a medical-based one, you can ask friends and family to help pay for that. You know, hey, instead of gifts for the holiday, can you help me uh, go on this mission trip? You'll probably actually get a little bit more by asking that way. Um, so you try out whatever you can do there. Try and not borrow for these trips. You know, if you end up having to take a few hundred dollars out after you fundraise the last thousand, okay, that's fine to make the make up the difference. But try not to fund to do an entire trip strictly on student loans. One, it's not what student loans are for, but two, it's just a really expensive way of doing it. All right. The a big pitfall people have is that the beginning of the month they're like, I've got a lot of money. And you buy something really expensive the first week. You're like, oh, you're eating steak and you're eating shrimp the first week. 
And then you're like, oh, oh, that was a lot more money than I thought it was. I guess it's just ramen from here on out. You know, and and the old college trick from when I was in school was thing of ramen, half a bag of frozen vegetables. Not exactly healthy or even that good, but it did keep you alive. Instead, if you can budget properly and and be consistent throughout the month, you're going to eat pretty well all month. And if you get to the end of the month, that's your time to reward yourself. All right. What about this? I didn't want to pick on a particular brand like I did with Starbucks earlier. Uh, This would be convenience food. Um, I've seen it up in the freezers and fridges upstairs. Uh, I do get it. One, that stuff ain't healthy. Look at the sodium content. And if if you got one of the lean ones. If you got one of the regular ones, look at the fat and the sodium content as well as everything else. Um, On the other hand, you're also just not getting good food for what you're paying for it. Even those dollars... One dollar meal kit things are are just not a properly balanced meal. It's not healthy for you. It's not a good place to be spending your money. You want high yield food. You want things that are nutrient rich, uh, as well as being energy energy dense. All right, this is a tough one for a lot of folks, Southerners and Northerners. Doesn't really matter. Um, and Chick Fil A's are standing here for all restaurants. A pitfall to everyone's budget, and I've worked with med students for years. And I've also been, I'm a real person, so so this is a pitfall for me too sometimes, is going out to eat. It's convenient. It takes a little bit of time to plan a meal to cook at home. It takes some time to go grocery shopping. But if you're going out to eat more than you have budgeted for, it's a really quick way to blow that budget and to spend a lot more money than you should. All right. This is another one. Pets in med school. I'm not saying don't have them. And this is actually one, uh, this is uh, Dobby. We just got him this week. Um, But pets can be expensive. If you're going to have a pet in med school and you don't already have one, I'd recommend a cat. They're a lot cheaper and a lot easier. Um, But if you're going to have a dog, just expect that some of those costs are going to be a little bit higher. Um, And so factor those into your budget. And it becomes even more important for you to leave that buffer in the budget so that when an emergency comes up, And I can tell you, our second year as a med school, everyone's dog, I think, had to have surgery, even mine, um, with our last dog. So be careful, be cognizant of what they actually cost you. It's not just the food every month. It's the vet bills. It's the emergencies. Be ready for those. And those are things that I can't do increases to cost of attendance for. So if you're already at the limit, I don't want to have to tell you, look, I can't give you more money for Fido's surgery because you're at that limit. So that, that's where budgeting does come in come in handy and staying below the maximums. Uh, better yet, in terms of a budget, is not to have a pet, but I do understand the value they bring to a house. Uh, again, cats are cheaper. Uh, Lucy would agree with me on this. All right. We're not going to do the application because there's only really two of you, uh, or at least I'm not going to break you out into the groups, even though I wanted to try that feature out. Um, just thinking of your own budgets, Cameron and Andrew, How could you cut $50 a month from your budget and and still be all right? Um, I mean, my car is kind of old, so, like, it's paid for, and I have, like, a car payment thing um, to, like, save up for a car. Um, So I guess, like, if I had to, like... (laughs) That is one I would definitely cut, especially if you're living off of loans. Um, I, I would never borrow for future expenses like that, um, that might not happen. I'd instead rather you have that money sitting out there as a potential to borrow so that if your car actually dies, you can go and borrow it. Uh, I must say as a disclaimer, strictly speaking, federal aid can't be used to buy a car. That's in case any feds are watching my video. Um, you know, had to get that out there. But, you know, I'd rather you just borrow that later if you needed it. And, and at that point, we're not really borrowing it for the car. We're borrowing it for my other expenses so that you can free up other money in your in your budget for the car. That's how we, we work around it when the feds are listening. Um, Cameron, what do you think? Where could you save some money? We talked about it earlier for you. Food. Food. Yes. Um, probably was, particularly... I'm curious eating. Um, to hear your <laughs> thoughts on whether or not, like, how, how much better would it be to just 
kind of focus more on getting frozen produce and frozen vegetables, not so much meals, just like, for example, to make smoothies, like getting frozen fruits and frozen spinach and buying that in bulk instead of um, kind of getting the fresh stuff and then the potential for them to go bad. They only last two weeks. So I think that really depends on you in particular. I really like frozen fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, I, I'm not joking when I say that every night instead of a bowl of ice cream, which is what I used to have, I sit down with a bowl of frozen mango and pretend it's ice cream because it's got that kind of creamy texture and really good flavor. Um, that works out well for me and it's nice and, and an affordable way of doing it. Um, sometimes you're gonna want fresh stuff, but when I say it depends on you in particular, it's do you use all of your fresh stuff that you buy? You know, my family, we go through a huge amount of fresh vegetables. I rarely have ever had to throw anything away. Um, so, and I also keep the things up front in my fridge. It's kind of a uh, stock rotation. If it's up front, it's either older or it's something that goes bad really quickly. So that gets used early in the week. You know, if you are prone to, to not using things, stick with the frozen. Buy that stuff in bulk. You know, I went to Lidl last week and bought bulk mango and bulk um, frozen uh, strawberries for smoothies because my kids are on a real smoothie kick lately, and that's a lot healthier than crap cereal that they've been eating otherwise, um, which I don't buy much of, but I've been nice to them lately. Um, so they've been on the smoothie kick, so I wanted to go ahead and buy this stuff in a bulk size so it's a little bit cheaper per pound. Um, we'll get really in-depth into that on the grocery savings uh, seminar that we'll probably do next month. Um, so just kind of keep your eyes out on the newsletter for that and, and spread the word. So there's more than just two of y'all next time. Um, but yeah, food's a good way to cut your budget. Uh, after your rent, which you only get a chance to adjust once a year, your food budget is where you have the most control in your entire budget. And you can usually for most people find a way to save. Um, now I'm thinking in particular of one of our fourth years this year, he probably has absolutely no room to save because he and his wife have a food budget of $150 a month. Yeah, I saw your faces. That's impressive. He's like one of my top students when it comes to his food budget. But that's not possible for a lot of us. They eat a plant-based diet, uh, or largely, not exclusively, but largely plant-based. So, you know, for them, that works. My family, we're, we're very omnivorous. So, you know, we'll do plant-based meals and actually pretty regularly. It's just not every meal. Uh, and so animal-based protein is going to cost us a little bit more. You know, a lot of folks are the same way. Or, you know, you start buying a few of your wants, not necessarily your needs with your food. Um, but, yeah, food generally is where you have the most control over your budget. In a month to month, I can make an immediate change way. All right. What questions do you all have? And, Andrew, you, you kind of jumped in on the end after we went through the bulk of the budgeting stuff, but... Yeah, I realized that it was still going on. It's your email said it, I guess, went till three. So, but I guess that would be if there were more people asking questions in the book. <laughs> yeah, normally we have, we, we take the time to stop for the, uh, for that exercise. I break you out in the breakup groups or, or if we were in person, I would actually just tell you to work at your table and, and talk about ways you can cut your budget. Um, but yeah, questions also uh, do, do extend the presentation a little bit. Uh, Cameron, Andrew, you have any questions or y'all want to get back to your day? Um, how, how do we sign up for a meeting? I probably need to go through with you, my budget with you. <laughs> after you stole me. Um, so the best way to sign up for a meeting with me, especially now, since we're, we're doing like a lot of work from home stuff, uh, is to go to any web or any email I've ever sent you. And at the bottom of that, it says, uh, click here to, to, to set up an appointment. And so you click there and it takes you right out to my calendar and you can add, add your meeting to it so that you can, we're not going back and forth. Like, hey, how does Thursday look? Oh, Thursday looks okay, except for these times. Okay, well, I want this time and can you do that? And things like that. Okay. Now just click the link and you can you can sign it up. And if it's a day I'm in the office, I'll, I'll shoot you an email and say, hey, I'm actually gonna be here today. Do you wanna meet in person or do you wanna meet virtually? If it's a day I'm not gonna be in the office, I'll shoot you the link for a virtual meeting. Okay, when, when are you typically in the office? I probably prefer. Tuesday, Thursdays uh, are generally my days in the office. A um, couple times that's not not the case, but I'd still recommend looking at my calendar. Uh, every once in a while, we've got culinary medicine, which generally happens on Tuesday afternoons. 
Uh, so that takes up. I'm usually not available most or the Tuesday afternoons when those happen. Uh, and then we've got admissions days here and there, uh, all scattered about, which you both remember with fondness, I'm sure. <laughs> yep. Happy to meet with anybody to talk about their, uh, so this is for everyone. Happy to meet for anybody to talk about the budget, uh, go over yours in particular, uh, or just answer any questions and, and maybe try a different variety of budgeting if, you, if you're having some trouble. Cameron, you, you unmuted yourself. You have any questions for me? Uh, just want to say thank you for, for having this. I feel like I actually got a lot out of it. And Happy to help. Um, and, and we'll do it every year if you need a refresher next year, Cameron. Uh, that's if you can get off rotation. And Andrew, same for you. Um, but guys, if you don't have any questions left, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I can stop the recording here too. And I guess I'll watch that first half. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I would highly recommend it. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, guys, take care. Take care.